Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are on the yet another episode of the Binod Portal Show. We started this show during um, the middle of this pandemic when the lockdown was started in various countries of the world to motivate and cut off few infodemic and the stresses. We are almost on our 60th episode of the Binod Portal Show. Until now, we have spoken on various topics related to especially Nepal and the police around the world. Not only that, we have um, got a few guests from different parts of the world talking about various international um, issues as well. Today, as we have already um, mentioned in our flyers a few hours ago, we will be focusing more on the issues related to women, empowerment, in an international level, how are women, basically in South Asian region, where male dominate the society, where males are the leader in the house, and it is called man in the house, which is very, very common. We don't, we, they never see women in the house. So. With us today, we have got a guest who, is, who has been in media for a long time, started working in Nepal television since the beginning for 20 long years. And then now she became activist, working for women, raising voices. Recently re-elected for United Nations CEDAW committee as well. Yes, I'm talking about Bandana Rana. She is a co-founder of Safi Sasta. Very popular media person from Nepal and committee member of CEDAW, United Nations. I would like to welcome to the show. Welcome to the show, Bandana Ji. Thank you. Thank you so much. A pleasure to talk to you. How are you today? I'm good, and congratulations on your 60th episode. Thank you very much. And also, uh, definitely more than us, we have to con congratulate you for the re-victory in the committee of CEDAW. And it is a pride moment Thank for you. Nepalese, Thank especially you. not only Nepalese, South Asians, uh, for you to be in this position, re-elected, which is not a very easy job. You know, this international level, tough competitive and uh, it's a tough competition election as well and definitely your first um, term has been a really good so you have been re-elected and you've got more responsibilities and and thank you very much for giving your time during thank this you. Uh, very busy city all as well thank you my pleasure to talk to you uh, but then as you we have decided uh, we have uh, you know designed this so uh, to motivate people uh, around the world especially um, people from Nepalese background who are around the globe now. Um, you know, more than this pandemic, the infodemic happening in social medias have uh, you know, created more mental health issues in people. Just to, you know, our aim is to at least motivate people and get them to know more about the people they are, they've been a fan, and follow, I mean, a fan of and following um, in their lifetime too, and as a role model. Our tenary question to everyone is, how do you feel to be where you are now? Like people know you as Bandana Rana, the media mm -hmm. person, international um, women leader, um, working, uh, working, working in CEDAW, plus you're activist. You, you co-founded Sati Sasta, which is doing fabulous in Nepal. Also, you empower many women in your, uh, especially during this pandemic, we can see you are live with people there. You're with various leaders, young leaders from different community, talking about um, in uh, various different issues as well. So when you when you look at yourself um, from the day you started, you know you thought of being in media and, you, uh, and coming into media, becoming an activist, and now you know crossing the border and becoming a global leader um, uh, through CEDAW as well. How do you um, you know how do you summarize your life journey? From the beginning till date. Yeah. You know, Binoji, I never plan my things. 
it wasn't my ambition when I was growing that I would be here, I would be a TV personality, I would be an activist, or I would today be actually in the global forefront uh, working for women. That was never my plan. I never dreamt about it. I never had that kind of amb ambition. I never do, actually, you know. I, I actually go where my destiny takes me in the sense that where I feel comfortable, where I feel uh, I'm giving my best and I'm able to give my best and where I feel I'm making a difference. You know, that if that is the kind of environment uh, that is uh, that I pursue and it's uh, the life's uh, track has just taken me where I am today. You know, it's just those are my principles. Whatever I do, I have to believe in it. Uh, I give 100 percent to it. I have to be able to give 100 percent to it. So my belief, my 100 percent to it. And then I do my best and leave the rest to, as they say, to God, you know, and, and that's how I have achieved my, my, whatever my destiny is today. I have achieved that. And I, I really don't know after four years where I will be. I don't even plan beforehand, but uh, I just go where my questions take me, where my desires take me, where my, where my ambitions, I wouldn't say ambitions, where as I said, where I feel comfortable that I'm giving back to the society. So that's how it has been all the time. I, I never planned it. But as generally, such. generally people say, you know, the successful people, the role models in the society, they are there because they plan their life. There's a stereotype thinking that all the successful people have got a proper diary written and a plan written um, with a vision and you know the goal set and the mindset is all ready so that they're there. That's what people say uh, when they have to motivate or scare youth of the, uh, these days. <laughs> do you agree yeah. on that one? No, I do agree. You have to have some kind of purpose in life. You know, I'm not saying you have to be. You can be goalless, and then you'll achieve a lot. You have to have a purpose. And my purpose was. Uh, was, as I said, you know, I, I studied in a, a missionary school in Nepal, in St. Mary's School, where I, I was an average student, where um, uh, the, the class that I liked the most was the moral science class, which was early in the morning, first period in the morning, you know, and that really woke me up because it was a story after all. And as young children, you like stories, you know. So these were fables about what are morals. And, you know, at the end of the story, there was always a moral. So... When I look back, I think during my educational stage, what I liked most was those moral science classes and what, what actually impacted me and inspired me rather than the science and chemistry and mathematics and all the other history and geography that I studied. I think that was the class that left a stamp on me. You know, So I think it was that kind of learning, which as I told you earlier, my desire was not just to study and be a big person or famous popular person, earn a lot. It wasn't that. It was just a desire to give my best to the society, to give something to the society, to be loved. Actually, everyone wants to be loved, actually. And of course, I also want to be loved and to give back love in return. You know, so that's that was the purpose of my life. And that is what has guided me, you know, over the years with this purpose in life, whatever I did. I think I gave my 100%. And that is what achieved, um, helped me to achieve the kind of success that I am in now, you know, if you call it success. Uh, I'm, ha I'm happy. I'm contented. I think the other, other very big motiv motivational factor is I don't think too much about the future. You know, I, I actually live in the moment and give 100% to the moment rather than thinking of the future about where I will be in 10 years' time. You know, so uh, maybe for some people it works like uh, where will I be 10 years time so that I work accordingly. For me, the most important time is now. You know, what am I? I mean, I'm speaking to you now and I really want to enjoy this one hour. You know, I think that is the purpose to live your life for the moment, you know, and give your 100 percent. And then uh, you will feel happy doing it. And I think whatever your goal may be, you will achieve uh, subsequently. So that has been the way I have. Uh, led my professional life because if you tell me because when I was a young uh, person I never thought I would be an activist for women's rights you know uh, when I joined television in Nepal when television had just started uh, I, I had never planned that uh, you know of course we didn't even have television so how could I have dreamt about it right 
So I didn't plan to be in television, but it so happened that uh, I was a good orator. Even in school, I did um, uh, you know, take part in elocution con contests, uh, dramas and all that. So I, television had just started and I, I, I watched it and I said, oh, perhaps I could also do that. You know, it's not that I had a desire, but I just felt I could do it. You know, and it was more on the English news part, you know, where I felt that perhaps I could do that, you know. But saying that was easy, but doing it was very difficult. You know, like it's, we all know, like people who, are, who work on, the, you know, on screen, we all know how easy it looks when you hear, look at the screen, but how difficult it is, the behind the screen work, you know, and, and, the, and the concentration. That's what I mean, living for the moment. See, as a newscaster, the 20 minutes, 25 minutes news bulletin that I read live, I used to give 100% there. I didn't think left, right, center about anything else. So that that is the kind of learning I got. Even now in the CEDAW, CEDAW committee, there's so much of competitiveness, so much of alertness that you have to be, you have to be so prompt. And I think I learned that from television, that live telecast so many times, live reporting so many times, that you don't think of anything else but only what you are doing at the moment. You know, And that, that way you can really invest your whole concentration and give your best and the product i believe will be the output that comes out will be best so i think um, uh, as i told you but i mean this may not work for everyone but this has worked for me this is what i do you know so for me uh, I, I never dreamt that I would go to television. I did, you know, as, as um, uh, I, I felt I could do it. And there were um, some who supported me. I did go through the, um, the screen test and interviews. And, um, uh, but there was a dearth of English news readers at that time. There was hardly any English news readers. So, so the television needed me also very badly. And um, I, I actually, I, it was on the job. No one taught me how to read in front of a camera, how to have a eye contact with the camera, whether my voice was you know, modulated well, what kind of pauses I need to have. Now I feel if anyone were to enter television as a newscaster or a news presenter or a producer, there's so much to learn. I can't believe I did it without any technical learnings as such. You know. Um, Learning in the sense, the only learning I get was, okay, here's the news bulletin. You can practice, you know, and you can just check um, uh, when the studio is free. You can request the camera person to uh, say if he could go through a test with you. So it was like looking for the spot, whether anyone is free. It wasn't like a really schedule. And no one monitored me. They never knew whether, I, I, I mean, no one told me whether I was doing it right, whether I was doing it wrong, you know. So, and suddenly after 20 days or so, I was told you have to go live today because we don't have the other news reader, she's sick. So you have to go on live, you know? And it was a royal visit to Germany at that time, I think. Uh, it was a tough one, but, uh, but I, I managed. But the first day I still remember, uh, you know, the, the most difficult part, uh, I was excited because everyone is excited when you are, you know, waiting to be go on air. But my, uh, but practicing is different than going on air is completely uh, different. That's with the royal, royal family. That's right, with the very sensitive news and all that. And I, I do recall my most difficult time was just before the news when they play the logo music, you know, that simple music, and you haven't started yet. Because that's the time you get to think, and then you hear your heart beat so loudly. I really felt uh, the, the the audience could hear my heart beat as such. I could hear it so loudly, louder than my voice. But once I started, uh, I got hold of it. And uh, as I said, I had to continuously read for um, almost a month without another news reader. And I think that gave me the opportunity to overcome my fear. Like, for example, if I had read one day today and then they say, oh, your turn comes now after two weeks or after one week, perhaps the fear would have built up and I wouldn't have had that kind of confidence. But since I was reading every day, you know, I, I just got that confidence. I won't say I was the best, but because now if I look back at it, I'm sure I'll find so many faults and mistakes. But I'm happy that Nepal television at that time was the only television and um, I was, um, I was um, uh, you know, popular name very soon because that was the only television and people watched it uh, so diligently. And, um, uh, you know, very soon I became a household name, uh, you know, as the only news, uh, English newscaster for quite a long time. 
uh, at that time. And I learned on the job. I learned on the job. I learned from the critiques given by people. But one of my biggest lessons was um, uh, I used to listen to um, the BBC radio one you know to 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 see whether i would be i was being correct the pauses and all that and the other was um, i used to read the morning newspapers to make sure that you know like and my mind uh, i know no one told me but what i felt was in the studio it was the cameraman and me and the camera and me basically let's say you know so i used to imagine the camera is a person you know and i i had to i had to speak in a way that that person would understand me so that was my that was the only thing I thought. I didn't think about the wide world who was watching me, but it's just the camera and me, and I have to make that camera understand what I am saying. You know. So I think that is what motivated me. And I, I, I in, initially I was a full timer in television for six seven years. I uh, it was not just the news reading. It was editing. Uh, you know. It was reporting. It was uh, production. I was engaged in. So I learned a lot on the job, and I think that kind of lesson you just can't learn today. It, you have to go through it to gain that kind of experience that I did. You know, I, I was, I still remember my first live telecast was the third SARC summit, you know, and it was the first time that this was the, 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 that, the international summit of that scale was being organized in Nepal with seven heads of state coming to Nepal. And, um, uh, Earlier, I was told that, um, uh, you know, oh, you'll have to do just uh, two minutes in the beginning and two minutes in the end. And it's uh, uh, Durga Nath Sharma, who was the news uh, news um, uh, director, that he will do the most of the part, you know, in Nepali. But just the day ahead of the event, the, the chairman called me and he said, oh, we have it all wrong. This is an um, uh, international live telecast program with seven countries watching, and it has to be in English. So we'll, you'll have to reverse the roles, you know, you, you will have to uh, report much, much longer than, than, than uh, Durga Nachi. So it was just a day ahead in the evening and to the early morning, 4 a.m. I had to report for the live telecast, you know. So I hardly had any time to prepare. With all the knowledge I have now, if I were told to do that in the way I was told, I wouldn't be able to do it today. But at that time... You just feel good that the, the 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 management has so much confidence in you that such an important task has been given to you that you just feel you can do it. I did have the knowledge. I didn't have the know-how. I had never done a live reporting. I don't know how to hold a mic in the when there is a huge noise and band playing. It was the head of state entering. I didn't know how to report uh, of the heads of state. And you had a cameraman. Uh, who's, you know, we, we didn't have cordless um, wires uh, mics at that time. So my, my the, the cord of my mic was connected to the camera. And the cameraman is only concentrated on, he says, when the head of state come, I have to take a 360 degree turn. So make sure your head doesn't come in front of my camera. So here was the wind blowing. I had um, notes in my hand, mic in my hand, my sari flying. Uh, the heads of state coming in, and I had to speak at the same time. Know who, which head of state was coming in. Know a little bit about their background as they as the carcade comes, when they get down, when they enter, and make sure my head does not come into in front of his camera when he takes his turn. So my position was I had to bend. I couldn't even stand straight. Whole lot of concentration is required, and that's immense valuable learning. You'll never get anywhere. You know, no, no. With the, with the limited. With the limited, um, uh, you know, resources that time, and also yeah. with that deal to be, you know, uh, liked by the management and to be, uh, you know, to be pampered by giving given the job um, on the spot. What helped you to be ready at all the times there? Ready at what? You, you, you were like, you know, uh, these days now, youth nowadays have got everything, all the resources in their palm. They can oh, do right, research. Yes. They can do yes. everything, but that time you had very limited resources around, yes. and uh, you seem you to be very. Know, uh, I, I, we had to read mostly from a written uh, script. Uh, some of the handwritten script were worse than a doctor's, you know, incomprehensible. So I'm very good at reading handwritings, you know, and uh, sometimes it came just before the bulletin was aired. Sometimes you had arrows and lines going in down and coming up again. So I had to edit while I read live. And I had samples. I, I actually, I think it was in, when was it? 
some years, 1992, I think, I had the um, opportunity to go to Atlanta. I was doing a course there, a postgraduate diploma course on management. And uh, I, I had this keen desire to uh, visit CNN, you know, so my course instructors took me to CNN because they knew I was working in television. And I showed them the script that I read and they were they were shocked. And they said, my, we would never be able to do that. You know, we didn't have a teleprompter. So it was like reading it, you know. So they said, oh God, you are more professional than we are. We will not never be able to read this way, you know. And uh, the people will be surprised. I didn't know how to do makeup. You know, because that is also presentable being visible. There was no makeup room. There was no makeup person, no makeup artist. Um, uh, so whatever I knew, the bit that I did, I used to do. Uh, it was okay. I must have looked okay. It's not that too good. I know like now you have all kinds of resources. You have the teleprompter, you have editors, you cannot even write, you know, uh, read from a written script, you know. So, but, but I have no regrets because what I feel is because my early life was a struggle, um, uh, I got more confidence. I was, I was, um, uh, you know, my my ability to handle difficulties uh, was was very enriched. Uh, you know, to be able to decide impromptu because you know sometimes the editors had may have written wrong. There may have been mistakes, but I just had to. You know, I remember at one time. Uh, I think it was Surya Bahadur Thapa had just um, uh, resigned from being a prime minister and it was Girija Prasad Koirala. But the editors, they wrote in a hurry because they were so used to writing Prime Minister Surya Bahadur Thapa, they wrote Prime Minister Surya Bahadur Thapa, you know. So as I was reading, see, you have to think of so many things. You are reading, you are going on air and you are already looking at the next line and you can see the mistake, you know. So I, as I was reading, I had to correct it and read it. It can't be. You, you know? have to have so, the presence of mind, isn't it? Exactly. The, that that level of presence, that level of presence, your every hair needs to concentrate, you know, so much. So I think um, uh, having gone through that kind of learning at a very young age, uh, I'm able to handle a lot of adversities, you know, and uh, and and be able to be more calm and composed even in during very complex uh, situations. So I, I owe a lot of credit how, to Nepal. How do you feel when you, I, when you see? How do you feel mm -hmm. when you see uh, these, these days um, people like you know, everyone in the media in Nepal? There are like so many national televisions now, and also um, it, the progress is you know they, they you know each and every state in Nepal is most of uh, I would say every district now in you know, a previous district now states and everything have got their own television uh, you know national television capacity as well. How do you feel with the progress? Plus, with that one, I would no, like to add you. one question. From, uh, there's a question in Facebook uh, platform from Damodar Achari. He asks you, uh, "What difference we need? Uh, you know, what difference we need to put for? We need to do for putting the Nepali media and global standards. As we only uh, talking about what we have done and most of the cases, we only share the experiences. But why not we share what we what is missing and how?" your experience can make the change i think we, we can we can merge those my question and damodarji's questions uh, together sure. i think damodarji wants to ask you uh your experience from since the beginning uh now you've seen the change in the media media industry in nepal what what can they um get from you or how, how can they um, be benefited for the changes sure you know like i am uh... I mean, nothing can be compared to the time that I worked in television now. You know, you have so much of resources. I look at the young girls that appear on screen and I feel very good. I feel very proud because when I joined television, there was also this uh, this uh, taboo that I was married already. I had young children. I married very early. So I had young children and I was a daughter in law of a house. And actually in my family, it wasn't a um, ritual, uh, you know, it wasn't very common that uh, daughters-in-law go to work. That also return in the middle of the night, you know, <laughs> past midnight. So it, I had this taboo also where my associates, relations, uh, neighbors did talk about, oh my God, she's young, she's, uh, you know, she's a daughter-in-law, you know, like she, okay. she appears, uh, she comes late in night, she goes out to show her face. What is her husband doing? Uh, sending her to show her beautiful face they don't think about the hard work that you need to do you know sometimes I always say a beautiful face is not always an asset 
sometimes it's like a it's like you are going for a war every morning you have to prove yourself even more every achievement you do do you they think you have a beautiful smile that's why she got that you know so it's not the hard work that so beauty is not always an asset that's also my learning you know <laughs> that is that i have but but I, i i do feel the the generation of today are very smart uh, you know are very confident uh they are able to take a lot of hurdles they have the aptitude to do much more but sometimes i'm also disappointed by the cutthroat kind of competition you know the the the, the uh, there is no ethics at that time i mean we we were we had such ethics you know like you wouldn't the way you question your interviewer you know interviewee uh the kinds of questions you ask the modesty uh, the humility i think it came all as part of the job but now you feel uh, at times i do see the more aggressive you are the more negative you are you feel that you are going to uh, get a lot of fame so that is what they need to get rid of you know that is because people can be very modest very informed and be very sharp and at the same time with modesty and humility be able to put their things across you know and get the best out of the person they are be, they are interviewing so that there is a very thin line there are there is aptitude there is capacity uh, there is confidence but there is this cutthroat competition there is um, uh, you know very little regard for ethics uh, there is so much of negativity and aggressiveness so uh, we we really need to find a balance between that for nepali media to go into the global world you know so that's what i feel but uh, but another thing i feel is there are so many television stations now so as you said you know in even the smallest districts and everywhere but sometimes i feel oh during my time my i was that was the only television and people actually they were they became your family you know like the people i used to meet the i mean we didn't have of course facebook twitter and all those messengers and all that but the little the few calls that i got the people i met when i went outside they were so warm and nice you know they would recognize you and i would wonder how you know like it's you are actually penetrating into their bedrooms every day you know with your news so they you look so familiar to them and the kind of compassion and love they gave to you but now i we don't even recognize the news readers because there are so many stations so many news readers you hardly follow only one station so very few uh, actually uh, get to be known as we were i feel because i remember there came a time when i had some difficulty in nepal television and i wanted to resign and i and i actually gave in my resignation but um, two months later uh, the head of the organization the head of ntv called me and told me to please come back the audience the people the, of nepal were asking where is bandana rana you know like why isn't she reading the news so there was that kind of close proximity you know like people used to but which i don't find now euda gaya arko aunsa bhanne huncha ni aile ta haina so it was it wasn't like that at that time i think i shared that love and warmth Uh, with the audience you know that connection was there so that is the sound of the blue i would like to ask you one question it's just um, yeah. a part of joke it could be a, taken as a joke as well yeah. you know uh, those times uh, most of the people used to have only television were very rare in a village or uh, there used to right. be one television i remember mm-hmm. in my in my grandfather's house there was one television and every day during mahabharat and all news time yeah. used to be a big rush so uh, that used to be a black and white television with a shutter yeah. on it uh, so uh, people is to see when black and white right so whenever you used to go out did you did you get people knowing your knowing your name but not recognizing you because you were seen uh, in the television in black and white and you were out there in color naturally no actually people rag people i i i would feel initially you know i didn't know my I mean I wouldn't say celebrity kind of celebrity status I didn't you know, know that indeed I, you were a celebrity yes. indeed you are still celebrity because I would go to a doctor's clinic and there would be two three people saying hi kosto ununcha how are you namaste and I would like initially I would be very surprised do I know this person I don't know this person and I would start thinking how do I know that person so it took me some time to get used to it oh i am a known person you know and they feel that they know me so well even they couldn't trigger it but they felt that i they know me so well that they were talking to me like you know like ani arame unsa very closely without even realizing who i was and neither did i 
So I think uh, that kind of penetration my presence was, you know, and it felt good. But they recognized me. Most of them, well, you said most of them thought they knew me very well, but sometimes they found it difficult to place. And after some uh, time, it came back to them. Oh, she's the one from television, you know. So it would be like that. Uh, but basically, I, I liked the proximity. I liked people. Uh, it was, uh, I didn't, you know, when I joined television, I didn't realize I would be um, a publicly known person. You know, somehow it didn't seep in at that moment. So it took me some time to uh, know all that. And it felt good when you didn't appear on television for a week. People were, people would call up television and say, is she sick? Why is she not coming? You know, like, you know, for a week, I'm not there. People would ask that. Every day I spoke, I know there were times when I didn't even have a backup. So I, I used Maybe to have- You were I, part of their life, you know, daily life, you know, you used to right. read the news. That you were the yeah. source for the knowledge the whole day. That's also true. But I would be, you know, like I have read when I have had high fever. I have read when I have had um, uh, uh, terrible cold, you know, I have read, in my worst days, you know, so people have seen me in my worst day because there was no backup. I've read for continuously two months at one time because there was no backup. So you can imagine every night reading, I could have had my worst days, you know, like every day. So, so people have watched me grow through that. You see, so I think I think um, that proximity is missing today because you have so many, you have so much, you know. So I think I, I, also I, you are now. I, yes. Yeah, but indeed, with that with that experience and expertise, you have taken to a next level as well, and also representing us in an international level. Um, yes. During this conversation earlier, you said that um, you, you've been you've been a uh, daughter-in-law, uh, you've been a wife in, in the family, and going out, uh, um, you know, coming back home. Uh, could be, could you know, being in the, such a modern family, there was some, uh, you know, things used to be tabooed and all. But uh, before I go to the next topic, uh, there is another question already here popping up, and I think it's related to what we are talking now. Um, I'm sorry to break in between now. Uh, the question is from Swikriti Bhatta. She, uh, she's asking, I think she's in Sydney now. Uh, she's asking, while we are talking about media, print online, and uh, the drastic, incre incre drastic increase in their numbers, do you feel they can play a significant role in addressing issues and challenges in the face of gender equality in Nepal? I think this will this is going to touch my next question yeah. too. So I think it's up to you now. Yeah, you know. Okay, now I'm coming to my second phase. Enough about my my experience in television, yeah. which has made me what I am today. You know, because of that. But how did my activism start? And now I, I will come to the, the question also about how what media what role media can play. You know, I am, uh, there are two incidents that has struck me. One is in 1991, uh, I had this assignment from UNDP where I had to go to different rural areas of Nepal and collect voices of people uh, on what they thought human development was because this was for the first human development report of UNDP. So when I went to these villages for the first time, you know, I was a young journalist, for the first time I visited rural uh, villages, uh, rural districts of Nepal, where I had to get these voices and compile these voices. And uh, my first impression was, I, I mean, I enjoyed doing it, you know, I had already become confident by then. And I was taking interviews of several people from different districts and communities. But the interviews with the men were easy. They were easily readily available. They all wanted to speak. And I could take interviews after interviews. But I felt no one had dictated me how to take it, how many to take it, who to take it. But I felt uncomfortable. I said, I don't have women's voices. You know, I have only men's voices. And I, I said, I have to take women's voices. You know, I have to get women talking for this um, compilation of voices. So when I tried speaking to women, because at that time we had this big mic and a cameraman and a sound man, you know. So uh, every time I turned a mic to a woman, there would be four men speaking for her. Oh, she doesn't know anything. She's too shy. She cannot speak. She, she will not speak to you. And they would also run away. So I had such a difficulty. I was in a dilemma. I said, how am I going to get the women's voices? So what I did was I stayed longer than my assignment in those districts. And I said, how am I going to befriend these women? I have to be first friendly with them. So then I realized you need, I needed to wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning and go and meet them where they fetch water from a common tap. 
you know so that I, I i did that for a couple of days and that's when i discovered them they were singing they were dancing they were fighting they were quarreling they had voices and i first realized oh of course they have voices of course they can speak you know but it was the intimidation of men which did not allow them to speak you know so i asked them they didn't even know what human development was so i only asked them what troubled them the most you know what is peace for them and they would say that what troubled them the most was that's when my my activism slowly grew you know like domestic violence the the husband um, uh, you know under the influence of alcohol beating the wife you know blue black uh, uh um, dowry related problems some of the districts were near the indian border you know and there were intermarriages so there were dowry related problems there were you know even if they didn't cook on time or if the salt was not adequate they would get a beating at the slightest cause you know and uh, uh, so and 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 then um, in you know like sexual abuse you know by her own husband even you, know, you know those kinds of things and that it's not that i hadn't heard of domestic violence but hearing is different reading is different and listening face to face is different it moves you you know seeing them in tears shouting angry so that was my first revelation of oh my god you know are these kinds of stories never come to the table of a newsroom you know it never gets there we only talk about political issues but we never talk about the kinds of violence that women are facing in their homes inside their homes so i actually felt you know like my moral science came in then like i said when i was young i i was very influenced by the moral science classes and i felt here i am a journalist i have access to policy makers and i am a woman you know i understand their problems so perhaps it was my uh, role to actually take their voices to uh, to to take their voices to the newsroom to the policy makers to influence policies to change policies so that is when i actually found my niche and i said i would like to be that um, uh, what you call that um, change agent where i can take these kinds of stories uh, to the central level to the policy table uh, to the newsroom is possible so that was my first revelation of wanting to do that you know wanting to do that as i told you i i had no dreams no ambitions i only followed my path and then i did what i my conscience told me so that was my first conscience then i started gradually i started doing that because 1990 this was 1991 1992 we founded sati and our primary focus was domestic violence because i felt because you know media can do a lot but individually you can't do anything you have to be institutionalized you have to have a collective voice you have to have a movement you know so because of that we founded i i felt alone in the media i wasn't in a very decision making position i may not be able to make a huge difference but if like minded people got together had an institution had a purpose perhaps we can do more so that is how eight of us uh, founded sati and primarily we focused on domestic violence but my second um, uh, desire or you know like the, um, the ambition that came into me my activism let's say was uh, 1995 i had the opportunity to attend the fourth world conference on women in beijing in china it's called the beijing conference it's very popularly known as where 30000 women uh, mostly women some men gathered uh, for this conference it's one of the largest conference so far on women you know it's the fourth world conference i had the opportunity as a young journalist at the end of the conference there were 12 critical areas that was adopted by the member states this was a un conference of member states and one of them was women in media you know and there were so many media women that had come around the world and for the first time i felt women in media can make a difference women who are working inside the media can make that change you know so that was my another i always say my real activism was shown at the beijing conference because i came back and then with a number of other um, uh, few journalists that were there then women journalists we founded sancharika somewhere then in 1996 april 
you know so institutionalized this women in media sancharika samuha is a women in media forum which is uh, which was founded in 1996 i was one of the key founder and the first elected president of sancharika samuha uh, which is now doing very well it's flourishing it it empowers women who are working in the media but as i said you can make a difference but you have to be institutionalized you have to join the collective voice you have to have a movement building and that is the kind of movement building that sancharika samuha does you know that's what i imagined that's what i envisioned because i feel now sancharika samuha has done a lot at the time uh, when i was president of sancharika samuha i did a lot of gender training for men and women journalists i did a research on the status of women in media and at that time i remember there were we 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 found that there were 3% women working in the media on the professional uh, front of course we said 7% but the 4% was more administrative reception and all that you know today it's more than 20% 20 21 22% women so of course there has been a gradual change of course if you look at the newsroom women's voices do get um, uh, get into the news nowadays the kinds of violence that women face do get into the front page at times it is not like how earlier you know it used to be so sensational with the victim's photo name identity all given nowadays you you don't find that kind of reporting so it's been gradual but change has been there so yes women in media or media can play a very very important role to bring about the change that you desire i have i have experienced that first hand with the with the with the um, uh, inception of sancharika samuha and with the advocacy that we we continue to do even today in several issues on gender issues which has made a huge change so i think uh, that has been my other area of activism yes uh and i think we're going to take the last question on the media related uh, related as well um so this is the question from damodar acharya that he asked previous question as well um ladies and gentlemen this is the last question we're going to ask about media related because we're going to we've got huge topics to cover as well the last question from for the media from damodar ji is modern days of tr the trp tv journalists believe in negative and aggressive anchorism most of the private news channels and endorsed and are, are endorsed and is sponsored by one or another political parties since the total news itself is is scripted how the general viewers like me can differentiate the planned propaganda and real stories and of course your take on the yellow journalism looking forward to your answer well <laughs> i don't know if i'm an expert on that but what i want to say damodar ji is i think uh, with people like you there is no worry because there may be so many yellow journalism there may be so many media that are dominated by a certain political agenda but you are smart enough and intellectual enough and uh, you know and and um, uh, enriched enough to discern what is right and what is wrong because you have that kind of environment you have that kind of education so you can make your judgments what i am worried about is those who are not like you you know those who have not had the opportunity to have that kind of education those who have not had the uh, kind of environment where they can discern what is right and what is wrong that the vulnerable group that is the community that i am worried about with the kind of you know influx of youtubers the YouTube, one youtube is a, is a media itself you know the kind of propaganda the kind of yellow journalism you are talking about the kind of aggressiveness that is there the kind of having Uh, not to give back to the society or you know make a society or bring change to the society but more as a individual political agenda so my worry is this is going to happen no matter whether you or i or whoever says it you know i it's it's be, it's even gone beyond like you know censorship is also another issue over here but you know like how many will you censor how many youtubers you just counted hundreds and hundreds of youtubers everyone is a media person now but i think uh, investment has to be made where proper education analytical skills you know um, uh, of every individual who can judge what is right what is wrong and be able to discern you know and make their own judgments and not be influenced by what is being uh, you know aired or telecast in the way it is being done so my worry is not for people like you my worry is for people like others who do not have that kind of education and capacity and enrichment and i think people like you and me need to target there 
to see how we can empower that kind of community. I mean, that's the only answer I can give you. I'm, I'm very disturbed as well. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, we all are because um, if, uh, during the beginning of this show, also I started saying uh, we are more, you know, slowly killed by infodemic rather than this pandemic. Pandemic comes and goes, but this, um, you know, TRP hungry and then clickbaits, I would say. Clickbaits are creating the wax everywhere in the world. Uh, you know, more than coronavirus, this is the this is the clickbait viruses going around in our palms and uh, through our uh, you know laptop, iPads, phones, and everything. Especially kids and people, weak-hearted people, when they see it, it's going to be a big problem. So I think uh, people like us, like Damodarji, as you mentioned, um, I think we need to uh, train people around us. If we can help one person, that person helps another. So that's how we can. Um, create a media-wise uh, society, isn't it, Bandanaji? Absolutely. I, I work micro level, you know, not macro level. Don't think too up, you know. Well, like you said, one person I can change, I can reach out, I can touch, I can influence. I think, I, you, you know, it's it's a huge influence. So, yes. Now, during our talk, we have already touched uh, about your journey in Nepal television. Plus, we, uh, we had, uh, you know, deep insight about uh, how it was then and now and versus we covered a few questions from people as well. Uh, plus, we covered a few about uh, something about your Sincharika Samoa and Sati Sastai as well. Now we're going to talk about your uh, re victory, re election, <laughs> re elected. You being re elected in Sido um, Committee of uh, UN Sido Committee. Uh, many people have, we have congratulated you and your social media. Definitely, including myself. I have to include myself as well. They know what exactly it is. So we know our, our Nepali um, women, our Nepali, you know, our daughter of Nepal is in the international level uh, leadership role. We all talk like we go in emotion, but most of us don't know about it. What exactly it is, plus how it works, and your journey towards it, and the second term you are you are in the, this tough election, you are re-elected. Congratulations once again, and that one. Um, plus, please, uh, I, I would like to um, ask you uh, to you know, uh, give an insight on what exactly it is, what is your role, what this does, how our women or how our people can get benefited out of it. Thank you, Binoji. First of all, I would like to thank uh, through you, uh, all those who have congratulated me. Uh, last week, I was elected, re-elected for my second term in the UN CEDAW committee. And now to um, uh, explain to you what CEDAW is all about, because um, it's it's, you know, it's part of my journey that started at the very grassroots, national, the community women that I talked about, and then founding Sancharika, Sathi, uh, you know, and working at the national level, then taking those national experiences to a global level to influence UN policies and bringing back those uh, committed policies back to the national level to advocate. So the past 10 years had been, mine was like more like local to global, and then bringing back the global to the local, that was the kind of advocacy, you know, whether it's Nepal government or other governments that I was engaged in. But my biggest strength has always been, it was, it is today and will always be my experience on the ground because I still continue to work on the ground. Even today, as you have already seen, even during this COVID, I have been engaging with the youth because 2020, my resolution is engaging more and more with the youth because uh, we have to work with the youth, you know? So that is why during this COVID time, also I have been organizing youth webinars, um, uh, you know, on different topics related to gender. Now coming to CEDAW, the CEDAW, C-E-D-A-W, is called the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. So you see, it's about discrimination against women, something that I have been doing all my life. But what is it? You know, it is, you know, UN has nine conventions. It's called treaty bodies, nine treaty bodies, nine treaties that governments need to commit to in order to monitor the human rights globally you know, the human rights agenda that the UN has globally. Out of the nine conventions, nine treaty bodies that monitor the human rights, CEDO is one of them. You know, you have nine of them. One works on children, one works on uh, torture, one works on racial discrimination, you know, so there are nine. And the CEDO is the only one that works on discrimination against women. So it, it addresses all forms of discrimination against women, 
whether it is in laws, policies, participation, access to resources, health related issues, even in the family, divorce and marriage, you know, and your right to get children. So it's entirely, it's called a bill of rights, women's bill of rights. It's entirely a bill of rights of women. So why is this important? Because there are countries ratify this. They, they sign it and they adopt it. So they commit to the, the, to the mandate of CEDAW. Out of the 195 countries in the world, 189 countries have ratified CEDAW. It's one of the largest ratified uh, treaty, you know, convention. So there are 189 countries who are members of the CEDAW, who have ratified, who have committed to CEDAW, including Nepal, of course, and all South Asian countries. You know, so this is a, so the CEDAW committee, CEDAW has a committee of 23 experts from around the world who monitors the compliance of member states according to what CEDAW says. Now, how does it do that? Every member country has to report to the CEDAW committee every four years on what are the work that they have been doing. CEDAW has 16 substantive articles. You know, under those articles, as I told you, it's about constitution, it's about uh, laws and policies, it's about institutional mechanisms to work on gender, it's about reservation, temporary special measures, it's about violence against women, trafficking, you know, exploitation and prostitution. It's about participation in political um, uh, agenda, participation internationally of women. It's about um, uh, nationality. It's about health issues. It's about economic empowerment of women, employment, you know, uh, rural women, marginalized women, and family and marriage, you know. So you see in that, in these entire 16 articles, there are certain things that the state have to do. Now they have to report to the CEDAW committee every four years, what have they done under those 16 articles? And they actually send the report to the CEDAW committee, which the CEDAW committee reviews. And then the country is invited to Geneva to stay face to face with the CEDAW committee, where the CEDAW committee questions the state. It's like a court. You know, it's like a court, actually. So the country is led by a highest level of delegation, the concerned minister, usually. They have four or five uh, members as delegates, government delegates. And the committee members ask them questions, they, 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 you know, on every 16 articles. And they have to respond immediately. Only if they are statistically, they cannot respond something, they can write in 48 hours. Otherwise, they have to respond immediately. So after that review, the CEDAW committee gives suggestions. It's called concluding observations to the country that we have learned that you have done this, but this is where your weakness is. This is where your gap is. In the next, there are some priority issues to be done in two years, but generally the rest of the issues, by the time you come to us in the next four years, this has to be done. You know, So it has a very strong mandate. So in my this is my fourth year in the CEDAW committee. I have reviewed around 70 countries, seven zero countries, you know, where we give that kind of suggestion. So I feel very good because I came from, a, you know, I'm the first Nepali to serve in the CEDAW committee, you know, to be elected to the CEDAW committee. So coming from a small country where people don't even know where Nepal is, they, some of them even hadn't heard about Nepal, you know. So coming from a small country with a lot of experience in this area working on the ground, to be elected, first of all, it is very tough to be elected. It's a very competitive election process where interested member states file their candidates. You know, uh, for the election takes place in New York in the UN General Assembly Hall, uh, with the 189 member states voting. It's the countries that vote for the candidate. So you know, usually there are very uh, what you call developed countries, prosperous countries, rich countries who are standing for elections, who have a very, when I say rich, prosperous, uh, developed countries, they have a very straightforward strategic agenda. They know how to go about it. And for someone like Nepal, you know, like a candidate from Nepal to come from a small country, we are not so experienced in elections, especially in my first term. Second term, we did much better. My first term, to tell you honestly, 90% of the Nepalese thought I was doing a mistake, that we, I would lose. 90%, you know, like thought that I would lose, that it was a mistake to file my candidature itself. 
you know. So my first term election was extremely tough for me to be able to prove myself. And individually, I needed to show, I needed to meet, I needed to campaign, I needed to go to New York, I needed to meet the representatives of member states in New York UN missions, lobby with them, prove myself. They had so many questions to ask, you know, in, in different kinds of knowledge about CEDAW. I'm happy that I had some substantive knowledge because even when I was not in the CEDAW committee, uh, I used to use uh, CEDAW as an um, as, um, activism, as a lobbying point to advocate with governments for policy changes. And I had actually even trained journalists on CEDAW, what it is, even before I was in the committee. So I had knowledge in the use of CEDAW, but it was a tough fight. It was a very tough fight. Uh, I mean, I mean, I can write a whole book, uh, you know, about just my struggles, my pains, my thoughts, how I kept myself stable, because uh, during my first term, my candidature was announced just three months before the elections. So we had only three months uh, to work on it. And during that three months on my personal level, I went to New York three times, a total of nine weeks in New York. I went to New Delhi twice because most of the embassies uh, are not stationed in Kathmandu. They are stationed in Delhi to look after Kathmandu. So I went to, to Delhi twice and met more than 50 ambassadors. I went to Istanbul because there was a humanitarian summit where the whole world was coming in Istanbul and it was an opportunity for me to lobby. Uh, it, this was I, I did this personally, though government allowed me to go to it. I did this personally in my first term. And of course, the government also helped me. Without the government's help, you cannot do it at all. This is a very, uh, you know, like the government has to be extremely committed and have a very, uh, very uh, clear uh, strategy as to how, how to work with the uh, candidate to win this election. So my first election actually uh, was very, very difficult, very difficult. And uh, I was I was elated when I won this election. I felt it's the goodwill of the, um, you know, the, the member states that voted for me as well. But my second election, the reason I uh, I was very skeptical about it because you know you may wonder, okay, Tar Barsa, you already have had a first term. Why do you want a second term? I also thought the same when I entered for the first time. I said, my God, let me give my best for the four years that I am there. But once you are there, you realize uh, most countries. Have, uh, they always, if you have a good candidate, they actually feel it's very difficult to get in. But once you get in, it is second term is extremely important because you are more grounded with the knowledge. You are more, you know how to handle things, you know the policies, you know. I'm not a lawyer. Most of the predominantly, uh, it's a 60-40, it's a you know, 60% of uh, CDO committee members are lawyers, 40% are non-lawyers, and which is very necessary because you can't have lawyers telling you everything. You wouldn't understand anything you know, the legal language. So you have to have communicators like me also to demystify those uh, legal things so that people understand. And to tell the lawyers, this is not understood, you know, like you have to demystify it also. So I'm learning. I'm actually thinking now I'm, I've almost learned so many uh, legal terms and how it makes a difference on the ground. And I, I had that ambition and passion to serve more. And I felt this was a good platform for me to be able to continue to take Nepal's experiences to this global arena and make a difference. So I was happy that the government uh, nominated me for a second term. Uh, our only concern was, you know, Nepal was also appearing for the Human Rights Council elections, uh, which is not a candidate, but uh, the country itself. Uh, and and uh, the election of the Human Rights Council took place in October and mine was in November. So within a month, it's very difficult for a small country to appear in two major elections. So my my concern was, oh, I may not have that kind of support, you know, with the Human Rights Council elections, so close. But I'm happy to say uh, I did much better than the first term. I secured 137 votes, the third highest votes out of 188 countries who voted, 137 voted for me. And I got the third highest vote. I'm happy to see Australia got in as well. You know, she's a very good candidate. I think Australia, they said after 20 years, they've got in now. So, so I'm, I'm looking forward to work with Australia also. But, but as I said, I'm very thankful uh, to the government, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, to particularly the New York mission who in a very short time worked so diligently because, you know, like with the Corona, I couldn't even travel to New York, you know, so I was very skeptical. I wasn't there physically. So uh, I, I did have a number of Zoom meetings with the embassies 
in New York um, uh, that was organized by the New York mission. But the New York team did splendidly. They did well. The Delhi embassy worked also. The Geneva embassy. So you, need, you see, you need to mobilize all channels to be able to... Um, uh, you know, stand for this kind of election. It's a very high level, competitive, global election. And for someone like me, who's never uh, stood for any kind of uh, election in Sancharika Samoa, I was unanim unanimously elected the president of Sancharika Samoa, you know, so that was with someone who has had no experience of standing for political elections. Here was a global political agenda that I had to go through. But again, my principle, my purpose of life, to give your best, don't think whether I'm going to lose after three years. What will I do if I lose? I never thought about it. I said I will handle it if it happens. You know, at that moment, I'm I living everything apart. Um, you you mentioned in your Facebook and social media. I, I mm -hmm. follow your Facebook social media a lot. Every morning I get I get your by now. Uh, my first thing, well, after I wake up, I see your wall. You've got a, every day. You've got one positive message to start with, but suddenly uh, one day I saw. Like, you were so excited that Prime Minister called you uh, oh, to yes. congratulate you personally. Tell yes. me something about it. Tell us something about it. So, uh, how like you received call yeah. and what what was the? I know about? it was very unbelievable for me, you know, and I felt very good because after all, uh, the head of the state, you know, the Prime Minister calls you. Not every day that a Prime Minister will call you. <laughs> it was around uh, nine p.m., almost nine p.m. at night. Uh, I got a call and I didn't recognize the number. So I was almost like not answering the phone. I, it's not that I don't answer phones. I do answer a number of phones. I'm quite accessible. But that day, because of my elections victory, I had been getting so many calls that it was getting very difficult for me to respond to calls. So I was, I was almost about to say, I'm not going to answer this call. I, you know, uh, but uh, it went on for a long time, and I just picked it up. So I said hello, and then the person said good evening. And I said, I was a bit surprised. And I said, good evening, Kobul Nova. I just said, you know. <laughs> and the other person said, Ma ke you know. So then, uh, you know, it was directly. It wasn't through a secretary or it wasn't through an assistant. So I was like, oh, my God. And I recognized the voice. Otherwise, I would have thought someone yeah. is joking, you know. Like, I recognized the voice, of course. I recognized the voice. And I said, oh, my God, Prime Minister Ji, Namaskar, you know. And then so he congratulated. So it was a, it was a real surprise for me. So he what if what if I'll tell you something? I just thought of something. You know, in yeah. Nepal there are so many mimicry artists, right? They 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 bring <laughs> up the, the voice exactly like Prime Minister. What uh, if it was just like that? No, I, I maybe at at one point I did think that also. What you had thought? You know, what if this person is mimicking? You know, I could I thought about it, but the things he said. Uh, made me believe it was him because he talked about uh, he talked about the feedback from the Delhi embassy. He talked about the Geneva embassy, the ministry, and how he had also given directions and how a small state can actually. You have shown that a small state can uh, still compete with big states and you win. So uh, the things that you were saying made sense to me. That no mimicry would have done it. You know, the person would not have known all that. So that made me feel comfortable. But I told him in the middle of the conversation, well, I can't believe it. It's so unbelievable for me. But but as a head of state, what I felt good was in my after my first election. Maybe people didn't know much about it. It was a first, um, you know, uh, uh, election, and you know, like I did not feel that when I returned. I was in New York then. So when I returned to the home country. You know, uh, none of the actually government people actually really acknowledged my win or welcomed me or, you know, like it wasn't like that. So I think it was the first time. So second time when I even I mean, there were not it was the prime minister who called me, but there were also several uh, uh, political leaders who called me, you know, uh, from different uh, political parties. So I felt that the country had sort of taken this ownership, you know, that they felt uh, they 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 they. They rejoiced in the pride that a candidate from Nepal had won, and this is our victory. You know, at that in my during my first election, I didn't feel that. But this time, even I, with the social media, I mean, the Tuesday it was uh, the election had taken place uh, Monday, uh, New York time, 10 a.m. You know, so by the time the result came, it was 2 a.m. Uh, in the in Nepal, 2 a.m. Tuesday morning in the Nepal. So you know, even in the middle of the night, the the foreign minister called me. You know, other ministers called me. So I really felt good that, uh, you know, and if you look at the social media, you told me you follow me. 
my my facebook got hung that day they said you have we have to restrict you and my my facebook was restricted for four days because there were too many activity too many activity with so many people i for me i mean you know losing and winning is part of the game you know you might have lost you know i might lose next time i don't know what it is you know it's part of the game but what is the biggest earning that i got was the love and warmth that i got out of this process i think that is the biggest gratification that i can feel you know that that i feel the joy about of course winning is a joy Indeed, the head joy. of state calling uh, from even from above that is the love and affection that i got yeah definitely indeed uh, my head of state calling from a direct number without any assistant in between mm -hmm. is is very rare and congratulations Fortunate once again on the yeah. call because it is not common be it whoever in that position it's the position who is calling you uh, that makes a big 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 uh, you know it, it has a, a big meaning uh, obviously for those who understand what exactly it is and also um now nepal being in cedo uh, for the second term um then obviously now uh, we you mentioned already of various political party um, leaders um, and head of, head of state himself uh, has acknowledged it now. The situation of Nepalese women in Nepal, in, in the empowerment level plus um, in the gender equality level, how satisfied are you or what can be done more or what has we not, what we have not been doing or what way we are lacking to bring our women to the level um, in, let's compare between the, uh, within our countries and South Asia, I think it's more, more uh, relative as well. So uh, what are we lacking uh, in terms of women empowerment and gender equality in Nepal? Well, comparatively, uh, since the time I started activism, I must say things have changed, you know. Uh, there are a number of policies, laws. You know, when we started work on domestic violence, people laughed at us, scoffed us. What are you doing, you know, working on domestic violence? Is that an issue to work on? That's a private affair, you know, you cannot uh, fragment, break families. Are you trying to break families? That was the kind of uh, response we got in 1992. Today we have a legislation on domestic violence. You know, people know that that is a grave issue. It's a national issue, you know. Uh, so not only that, we never talked about sexual violence publicly. Today, everyone talks about sexual violence publicly. If I go to the rural areas, I am so happy to see women's voices even stronger than in the urban areas. They are more institutionalized. They work collectively. Even the conflict has taught them to work collectively, you know. So uh, there are certain uh, religious rituals which are, um, uh, which are now being defied, which actually uh, perpetuated women, uh, you know, uh, which you could never have thought of in the earlier days. So I won't say that changes hasn't happened. Changes have happened. Nepal, in fact, in spite of the um, conflict, in spite of the massive earthquake that we faced, in a very short span of time, you can see women's participation uh, in the parliament at the local level has increased. Uh, it's one of the highest, not only in the region, but in the world, you know. So, so for a small country, we have made significant achievements. But of course, women are still being raped. More minors, I mean, I, we, in Sati, we have four women shelters also. More and more girls under 13 years of age are being raped that are brought into our shelters. There is so much of incest, fathers, girls are not safe in their own homes, you know. One in every three women are facing violence. There is so much of stigma and taboo. The access to justice is obstructed in so many ways. One, the justice system is expensive. The other, the justice system is not sensitive enough. The vulnerable communities cannot even enter into a court. You know, they do not have the means, resources, capacity to, to retain them throughout the judicial process. So the implementation is weak. You have laws, but the, the people who are to provide service do not even know about the laws. They lack sensitivity. We still have uh, patriarchal norms and values. There are so many religious rituals that perpetuate women who, who, who uh, you know, there is this very stereotypical belief about women's role and about men's role. So challenges are immense. This is something that we had committed in uh, Beijing 20, 25 years ago. Then the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, five years ago. But there's so much of unfinished business. Gender equality is in the progress, but at the rate that we are making progress, we will not achieve gender equality even in the next 200 years. 
So we have to be more swift. We have to work collectively. And women's issues is not just women's issues. That is very important. We need to engage men. Men need to be our allies. We need to find allies in men. This is not something, because if women are uh, you know, victimized, if women do not find their potential, it's the state also which loses. It's the family which loses. It's the society which loses. You know, and as a father, as a brother, as a husband, you would want your family members, female family members, to prosper, progress, to shoulder your responsibility. Because nowadays it's sharing responsibilities, whether it is economic income or it is household chores. So we need to. Uh, really promote this shared responsibilities concept. You know, in, one thing that touches me the most, uh, and I think we are um, almost about to end, and here I would like to say, 20 years ago, I was in New York in this UN meeting, one of the UN oh. meeting, and the, you have Asia Society in New York, which invited me uh, for a side event on uh, on women's issues as a panelist, being from South Asia. And the moderator at the end of the session said, you would ask one question and the speakers would have to answer that without thinking in one sentence impromptu. And I prayed that I wouldn't be the first one, but the moderator asked me the first one, you know, and he told me, um, uh, what is what change would you want to see in Nepal 10 years from now? Now, this was 20 years ago. So I the first thing that came to my mind was I want to see every household rejoice at the birth of a girl. That's what I said 20 years ago. You know, some of the papers also uh, uh, quoted it. You know what I said 20 years ago. But I fail to say I am very saddened with the thought that we have come at a stage where, because of science and technology, girls may not even give birth. Nepal has some preference of the highest level in the world. With the technology now, you can go through an ultrasound and identify the gender of your unborn baby. And many parents, if they are sons, they keep it. If, if it's a daughter, they uh, abort it. So forget about houses rejoicing at the birth of a girl. We may find gradually the population of the, the girls will not even have the right to be born. Now, how sad that can be. You know? So I think it is very important to send this message that whether it's a girl or a boy, you know, you need to have a child, you know, a healthy child, and a girl can equally contribute to the love and warmth of the home, the family, the society. So we have to promote the value of an unborn girl. I think it's so very needed at this time. Because if you look around, because I have been looking around now, you know, I don't see, you know, there are two sons or two daughters, but the third child is 80%. I've, I've, I've got statistics also. If there are 100 sons born, uh, born third, if the third child, if there are 100 um, uh, girls born, 180 sons are born. So that is the difference, you see. So third child, because they have a choice. They have science. You just go have an ultrasound. The doctor will tell you what is the unborn cho uh, child. It's a girl or a boy. And easily you can abort it. So I think that is very scary. So, uh, you know, like uh, uh, giving the girl the value of her birth, the value of her worth, giving, uh, promoting and um, uh, encouraging societies to understand, to know the value of a girl child, you know, and feel that they they will benefit by giving birth to a girl. I think that is so very important. These are some of the changes, Indeed. but we need to work together. We need to have a collective voice. Yeah. Indeed, we uh, we are towards the end of the uh, program as well for uh, today's episode, and also we're going to take the last question because it is related to what we're talking about, uh, women and gender equality uh, in our region. Uh, this question is from Sweetie Bata as well. She asks, South Asia has always had women who have led their countries. Uh, Benazir Bhutto, uh, Gandhi, Chandrika Kumar Tunga, even Begum Khalidazia, and our own Vidya Devi Bandariji. They say change happens when you are at the label. Uh, where decisions are made, yet uh, we see tremendous underlying issues. Your thoughts on it? Uh -huh. You know, I have, um, you know, I have two perspectives on this. Mm -hmm. One, as you said, of course, because of family ties and relations, political ties, uh, women have got to the top. The few examples that you gave of South Asia, you know, so what is the difference whether it's a man or a? I don't think that uh, huge changes can be made 
uh, just because you have a female leader. It depends on who is there and how sensitive you are and how capable you are to deliver that. Of course, that is very understandable. But on the other hand, when Bidya um, uh, Bhandari became the president, uh, first woman president of Nepal, I was overwhelmed because I hadn't thought in my lifetime I will see a Nepal's um, a, a woman as a Nepal's president. You know, I had never thought. So my 30 years of my lifetime, I'm happy to see a woman leader at the hem of a country in my lifetime. You know, that may not have brought about immense changes, but what change it brought about significantly is when I was growing up during the Sarah, we all know we are, if you all are Nepalese, you will know, during the Sarah, the blessings you get is May you get a good husband, you know, be happy, have a happy married life. And compared to my brother who would say, oh, thulo neta bhai, dere paisa kamai, ramro pade. That is the difference that I grew up in. And even now in many communities, that's how they were growing up. But now, just the presence of Bidya Devi Bhandari has given the message that a woman can lead a country woman can be a leader of a country and that is what that is the aspiration that a young girl growing today can see that i can be in the, in that position you know so that is the change sometimes the presence of a woman also brings about massive change in the way women are brought up in the way young girls aspire so that is the change that vidya devi bandari signifies i think you know because uh, even earlier times i remember in our parliament when there was this uh, reservation quota of 33% uh, most of the time you know we had the dalit quota you had many marginalized quota and many people said i remember some people said oh but she was she was just you know selling bangles how can she run a parliament you know but I, the 33% is a critical voice. That's why that's the minimum uh, percent that is required to raise that voice, you know. So I, I, I knew this particular parliamentarian who at first didn't know anything. But after a year, she was so confident. She had a voice. She could speak out. And sometimes when we talk about women, we think, oh, you need to take competent women. Malaita, and now I'm switching back to my Nepali because my memories are so strong. You know, I remember when I was the chair of Sanja, president of Sanjarika Samoa, and at that time, I think it was um, uh, Ramesh Nath Pandey who was the communication minister. And in one um, uh, event, uh, we were speaking, and he said, and uh, of course, our focus was you need to appoint women in positions. And he said, Come, there are no competent women. Kasan, where, where can you know? And I said, look, when you are appointing women, you ask about competency. But when you are appointing men, you just pick up men from the street, and uh, you know, you don't even ask about their background. Does your health minister know anything about health? Does your science and technology minister know anything about science and technology? But because they are political cadres, you are picking them from the street and putting them there. You know, so even if the women don't have competency, pick them up from the street. Put them there, you know, with a, that was the kind, this was way back, you know, way back. And you won't believe it. I said this very strongly, but in two months time, he, he, I didn't mean for my appointment actually, but he appointed me as the first woman uh, of the board of directors of the Radio Nepal. You know, you see, so it worked. It, it, I guess it worked. I mean, I set an example. I think I'm proud to be the first woman to be in the board of directors. I was also the first woman to be in the press council board. You know, so it it helped. And sometimes when I was in the press council, you've been a trailblazer blazer for everywhere, isn't it? Many uh, things you've done. I, as I said, I I go where my track changes takes me. You know, and I feel, I have to feel comfortable. When I was in the press council board, there were 13 men. Out of 13 members, I was the only woman. And I said, oh, my God, 13 men, I'm the only woman. What can I do? You know, two years, my term tenure, I did not have to raise the issue of women because I was there. Even before I raised it, the other members would raise it. So you see, the presence makes a difference. I, I, I have learned that your presence made a difference. They knew that because of my perhaps if I wasn't there, those issues would not have been brought up. But because I was there. All the time, it wasn't me who had to bring it up. It was the others who brought it up, you know. So that, I had two perspectives, as I told you. Thank you so much. Indeed, I enjoyed indeed, talking to you. Indeed, indeed, the change happens. Obviously, uh, the start, our, our women are in that position has um, raised hope in 
the younger uh, women as well and the girls in our society. Definitely, Vandana Ji, it has been a tremendous, and I really enjoyed this show, uh, talking to you today in this episode, and also would like to congratulate uh, you once again in your re-elect, uh, re-election as well, plus um, definitely your role um, in CEDO is going to help um, Nepal uh, much more, and obviously our women uh, will be more, uh, you know, reliant on your success and, our, and obviously our president's success and also, also they aim to be one of you and also get uh, empowered as well. Thank you very much for coming up in the show and thank you very much uh, for being with us, uh, accepting my invitation. And before we leave, if you have anything to say to the people uh, who are watching us now and will be watching us in future in our archive and YouTube, if you have the last, any message. Thank you so much, Binoji, for bringing back my early memories of struggle and passion and finding myself actually. And as I told you, uh, for me, live in the moment, live in the present, but give your hundred percent. Don't compromise from your hundred percent, the best that you can give. And I'm sure the best will come out of it. So that's all that I want to say. That's how I, that's, that's the purpose in my life. So that's how I go about every day. Thank you so much. It's been very enjoyable. Thank, Thank you, Vindanaji. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been talking to um, Bandana Rana, a mem- uh, elected, re-elected member of CEDAW, United Nations uh, Committee. And also we spoke about a lot, uh, lot about women in leadership, women empowerment in Nepal. In our next episode, we're going to come up with our new ge- uh, other guests with different topic related to Nepal and the police around the world. Thank you very much for your love and support till now. We've been not also. Keep watching and do not forget to subscribe us and follow us in our YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Keep watching the Binod Portal Show.